So thank you so much for having me, and uh, I, I'll just start by apologizing for running uh, a bit late here. Um, so uh, thank, thank you all for your patience. Okay, so let's just, uh, let's dive right in. So my name's Mike, uh, and I'm going to start my talk with an observation that I think we can all get excited about. Um, AI systems re have recently achieved uh, superhuman performance on some very challenging sequential decision-making problems. So what do I mean exactly by sequential decision-making problems? Uh, the problems I mean here are where there's an agent uh, in an environment, and it needs to choose a sequence of actions to achieve some goal. And the subfield of AI that deals with this setting is called reinforcement learning. And recent, recent advances in reinforcement learning have led to some really high-profile high breakthroughs in the scientific community and beyond. Uh, indeed, reinforcement learning has been applied successfully to achieve superhuman performance on Atari games and the board might go, and then more recently on StarCraft II, Texas Holding Poker, and even more recently on the game of diplomacy, which requires open-ended, free form dialogue and forming cooperative bargaining strategies with other human players. So, at first glance, these applications might all seem somewhat contrived, because who really cares about gambling and playing video games? But there are lots of practical, real-world applications in robotics and AI that you could formulate as video games, or as a form of poker, or as a form of diplomacy. So, in other words, there are a ton of real-world applications that you could formulate as sequential decision-making problems. Uh, in fact, there's one especially exciting application that we're probably all familiar with, perhaps without even realizing it, and that's ChatGPT, which is trained on, uh, uh, it's trained using a reinforcement learning technique that incorporates human feedback to make its responses feel more natural. But, okay, if we already have such powerful tools for sequential decision making, then it seems like we should already be able to build intelligent machines that can interact with the physical world in useful ways. So why don't we have household chore robots? Is loading the dishwasher really that much more complicated than playing StarCraft? I mean, in many ways, it should be less complicated, because I guarantee you that I'm better at loading the dishwasher than I am at playing StarCraft. And one of the main reasons, or in my opinion, one of the main reasons why we don't all have household chore robots yet, is that the reinforcement learning algorithms that we have today need a lot of experience in order to learn intelligent behaviors. So in other words, these, these algorithms are known to be really sample inefficient. They need a lot of experience to figure out uh, how to get the results they want, and it's just really hard to get that experience in the real world. Um, to see how hard it can be, to get real world experience, here is the so-called arm farm setup that uh, Google built a few years ago. And they needed to train all of these robot arms nonstop for a couple of months to get reasonable grasping behaviors. And that was just for grasping, which is only a small part of the overall problem of getting chores done. Um, so yeah, reinforcement learning algorithms work in the real world, uh, but it's just a huge pain to like run these algorithms in the real world. Can you imagine maintaining all of this infrastructure? You know, uh, the robots would break all the time, you need to replace this and that, uh, some joint is slightly loose, so now you call your equations are slightly wrong. Uh, you know, that MATLAB code that that postdoc wrote a while ago, no one knows what it does anymore, that crashes all the time, and then you need to reboot everything. I mean, yeah, so maintaining these robots is like a total mess. Um, and as we think through the complexity of maintaining this real-world training infrastructure, I think a critical limitation of reinforcement learning becomes apparent. And that is, most of the success stories out there, where reinforcement learning has been applied successfully, like you know, in StarCraft, are in domains where some kind of accurate simulator is readily available. And that's because simulators allow agents to get a lot of experience quickly. Uh, it's possible to scale up and distribute the learning problem in the cloud relatively easily. Um, and uh, it's always going to be easier to launch, say, 100 cloud instances running a grasping simulator than it is to uh, spin up and initialize you know, 100 real-world grasping robots. And I think even the ARM farm folks at Google would agree uh, that, uh, in practice, large-scale reinforcement learning almost requires accurate simulation or at least, at least benefits heavily from it. Okay, um, immersive 3D simulators, 
uh, can be especially helpful in robotics uh, because they can help robot agents to gain experience about the physical world. So here I'm showing one such simulator. This is AI2 Thor from the University of Washington and the Allen Institute. Uh, and this has been, this simulator has been enormously impactful in the research community and it has been a huge inspiration for me ever since it came out. But I think it's fair to say that existing simulators, AI2 Thor included, uh, have important limitations that prevent them from being applied to some of the most fundamental real world uh, problems in robotics. They have limited content diversity, so they don't come with many scenes, and each scene doesn't have that many objects that a robot can interact with. Now, of course, you can kind of work around this limitation by kind of taking the scenes that you have and then remixing them or uh, trying to uh, generate procedural variations of your existing scenes, but even in, even in those cases, you're still limited by the, numbers of, the number of scenes that you have prior to remixing. Uh, and these simulators are also limited by the realism of the rendering and the physics. Um, it's true that AI2 Thor is immersive, um, but it's also true that you'd never mistake an AI2 Thor image for a real image. So there's a big domain gap between the real world and the simulator, and this makes transferring behaviors to the real world more difficult. Additionally, existing simulators have a lot of magic actions, like an open door action or a closed laptop action, that don't correspond to the action space of any real robot. And that means that these simulators can't be used to address fundamental, low-level dexterous manipulation problems. So, one of the goals in my research group at Intel Labs is to build an interactive simulator that is suitable for household chores and other manipulation tasks that has greater content diversity and improved visual and physical realism. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be presenting uh, the simulator that we're building called Spear uh, that we think is making progress towards these goals. And I should warn you that everything I'm showing here is an early work in progress, so please go easy on me. But at the same time, I think we're making meaningful progress that the open source community and the robotics and AI community communities could get excited about, so I think it's a great time to share it. Okay, so Spear consists of 300 unique scenes with over 2,000 unique rooms and over 17,000 unique objects that can be manipulated individually. We've been working with a team of professional technical artists for several years to develop and refine these scenes. So here's a few of the scenes that we're developing in Spear. Okay, and uh, we're building Spear on top of the Unreal Engine 5, which is one of the most popular game engines for AAA and indie game development. It also has, and it also has a lot of next-gen graphics features. Um, it also happens to be 100% open source. Uh, it's free to use for research purposes, and it's even permissively licensed for commercial purposes. So we really like the Unreal Engine for, uh, for those reasons, and uh, we implement our scenes, our objects, and our robots as Unreal Engine assets. Okay, and here's a camera animation from our apartment test scene, and there's a couple of things in this scene that I'd like to highlight. First, uh, this animation runs uh, completely in real time. Um, in, on my desktop at home, this scene runs at roughly 60 uh, frames per second at 4K resolution. And even when we're rendering at that uh, quite high resolution, all the lighting and shadows and reflections are all quite photorealistic. Unreal does uh, make some compromises to hit that 4K 60 FPS uh, target, but these compromises are quite hard to notice. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, absolutely none of the visuals that we're seeing uh, in this scene are pre-computed. So this scene is fully dynamic. Every object can be moved. All the lights can be moved, the time of day can be changed, uh, and the rendering will respond appropriately in real time. Okay, and here I'm showing the same animation while also showing uh, the different image data modalities that you can generate in Spear. Um, so uh, uh, depth images are interesting because they mimic the observations that you would get from a real world depth camera like one of the new iPhones or a Microsoft Kinect or, or an Intel RealSense or something like this. Um, and 
uh, because we're running everything in simulation, our depth data is pixel perfect with no noise or artifacts. Of course, uh, you sometimes want your robot to be, or you, you do want your robots to be robust to those uh, real world uh, noise artifacts and stuff, but it's easy to add noise. It's hard to take away noise. So we're, we're happy that our depth images uh, are pixel perfect. Um, and then uh, semantic label images, that's where uh, each pixel is colored according to what type of object it is. Um, that's useful when you're training a passive perception system or also sometimes as a debugging tool. And then uh, the, the surface normal images are images where each pixel is colored according to how the surface is oriented. So notice that all the horizontal flat surfaces like the ground are all the same color. And that type of image can help a robot uh, to understand where to place objects so they won't fall over. Okay. Here I'm showing another spear sim, or sorry, another spear scene where we have simulated a little mini earthquake. Uh, and this highlights how cluttered our scenes are with objects that can be manipulated individually. Um, and so notice that nothing is glued down here or like a, you know, attached together as one big object. Uh, all the things in this scene that you can see are like individual objects that can be manipulated individually. Um, and that makes our scene, our, our scenes well suited for manipulation tasks. And as an aside, this type of like mini earthquake simulation is just a really lightweight way to sort of procedurally generate, uh, you know, randomized initial states for a cleaning task. Um, I, who hasn't woken up after a grad school party uh, where their apartment looked like that? Am I right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, here I, and here I'm showing another spear, uh, another spear scene where we are changing the time of day. Um, to highlight the fully dynamic lighting in our scenes. And uh, this type of uh, visual variation is, and, and again, yeah, this is running totally in real time, nothing pre-computed, nothing canned. Um, uh, you could attach the time of day to like a slider and play with the slider to your heart's content here and the visuals would just update in real time. Um, and this kind of visual variation is useful for during training because it helps a robot agent to uh, become more robust to the visual variations in the real world that don't change the meaning of the underlying task. You know, so like a robot should be able to clean the house uh, successfully no matter what time of day it is. Okay, um, we currently support a couple of different robot types uh, today, just right out of the box. Um, the first is this fetch robot that has wheels, a multi-link arm, and a gripper. And uh, this robot is well suited for mobile manipulation and rearrangement tasks. Um, here is our fetch robot in a different scene. Uh, and in this video, we're not doing a scripted sequence of actions. Instead, uh, a colleague is controlling the robot with our debug keyboard interface. So the motion isn't quite as smooth because uh, it's hard to control a complicated robot like this via the keyboard. But I still really like this demo because I think it highlights how the lighting is responding in a very natural, uh, dynamic way to the motion of the robot in the scene. Um, and it's just sometimes useful to debug things uh, interactively. So I, uh, I, I like this demo for that reason as well. Um, we also support an open bot uh, robot agent. So th this is the open bot. And we especially like supporting OpenBot because absolutely everything about this robot is open source. Uh, starting from the physical design specs, um, going all the way to the sort of high level perception and control stacks uh, running on board. Um, and OpenBots are really affordable uh, because um, the OpenBot, how, how the, the sort of, I guess, unique thing about the OpenBot framework is that it uses a custom app um, installed on an existing smartphone that you then attach to the robot uh, to, and you can kind of see there's like a little virtual like phone uh, attached to the robot here. Um, and all of the perception and planning and control uh, happens on board uh, the smartphone. So it's kind of a way of like turning your smartphone into a lightweight uh, robot and that's very inexpensive. Um, and so using um, an existing smartphone for this purpose, you know, it avoids like all of the custom parts and just ma it makes it possible to build a complete open bot for around 50 US dollars, assuming you already have the, your smartphone. Uh, and that's great for doing lightweight experiments um, that involve uh, transferring behaviors from simulation 
to the real world, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, discuss that in a few more slides. Okay, and finally, I'd like to uh, highlight our smart warehouse scene that we've been uh, working on and that we're about to ship in our next release. Um, and for this scene, we really tried to design it to be as functional as possible. You know, we drew inspiration from all of those, like how do Amazon fulfillment centers work, or uh, vi you know, videos on YouTube uh, and stuff like this. And we tried to sort of mimic the functional layout of, of an Amazon fulfillment center in this scene. Um, and so, and we'll be shipping this uh, in our next release. Uh, this is a really um, fun video, so I'll just like leave it playing for for a few moments here. Um, and the reason why this scene, uh, why it was important to us to build out this scene was we want Spear, we want to make sure that as we're building Spear, we're not sort of overfitting it to any one particular application. So we, we really want to, um, you know, try our best to support uh, a range of applications, different scenarios, et cetera. And we think that the kind of like, uh, the interesting robotics tasks that you might uh, end up doing in a fulfillment center like this are like somewhat different from the um, tasks that you do in the home and we'd like Spear to uh, be able to support both. Okay, um, so just to uh, concretely state our contributions here, so uh, Spear is an interactive simulator. We're not the only interactive simulator, simulator out there. There's, there's plenty of others and there's some fantastic simulators out there. Um, we think Spear is the simulator with the most unique scenes prior to remixing and uh, and also has the most unique objects. So if you're, fact, if you're considering the number of scenes that are included after remixing, then uh, iGibson 2.0 is better. Um, but of course, uh, you, all, of the, all of the fancy tricks that you might use to procedurally remix uh, your scenes, all of those remixing tricks and those procedural content generation tricks are complementary uh, to to the the sort of artist design scenes in Spear. So um, you could apply those say all those same tricks to Spear and then generate you know even more scenes, even more procedurally generated content with even more diversity. So it's good to have a set of kind of basis scenes that uh, that you're going to sort of procedurally remix and stuff. It's good to have a set of basis scenes that is as diverse as possible. Okay, um, I'd like to highlight as well that uh, all of our code is publicly available under an MIT license. Um, you, uh, for the stuff that I've been showing, um, with like a couple of exceptions, the warehouse scene isn't quite out yet, et cetera. Um, but for the most part, everything I've been showing, uh, you can just uh, get our code today and start running it today uh, if you wanted to and get access to, to all of that fun stuff. Um, and I'd also like to just highlight the kind of anatomy of a basic Spear program. So we have this uh, Python interface that provides a, you know, a much more convenient mechanism for kind of uh, doing control and doing sort of uh, learning, imitation learning, reinforcement learning, et cetera, um, from the comfort of Python that is sort of much more pleasant than you know, getting your hands dirty in the nitty gritty of the, of the Unreal Engine. So this is what a basic Spear sim, this is what a basic Spear program looks like. Um, it, this will be familiar to, uh, to anyone who's worked with the OpenAI Gym uh, interface. So, and we've actually mimicked the OpenAI Gym interface exactly. So our sort of env object here where you create it, it gives you some observations. You can, in a loop, you can sort of plug in your actions. Here I'm doing the actions that would drive an open bot forward. Um, and then when you, you know, when you call env.step, you plug in your actions and you get an observation and a reward back and, and, and stuff. And this is exactly how uh, the OpenAI Gym interface works. And in fact, uh, our env object inherits from the OpenAI Gym env object. So this really is an env object 
in the OpenAI gym sense, you can plug, and that means you can plug it into uh, whatever, uh, you know, your favorite reinforcement learning framework and it'll just work. Um, we've, we've done some experiments with RLlib um, and, and a couple of other frameworks and it just plugs right in. Um, okay, and uh, at this point, uh, so I'm 20 minutes in, um, I was 10 minutes late, and this is, a, this, and this is an, a half hour talk, so do we want to wrap it up right now, or do, we want, or do we want to say that this is still a half hour chunk? It's up to you. Half an hour, awesome. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about applications and experiments. Okay, yay. <laughs> okay, um, so one of, the, one of the experiments that we did um, uh, was a, a zero shot sim to real transfer experiment. So what, what did we do? We uh, used imitation learning in this experiment to train a point goal navigation policy um, with imitation learning. And uh, where did we get, so imitation learning requires demonstrations. Where did we get the demonstrations? Well, um, because we're running in simulation, we were able to get the demonstrations uh, using privileged information that's available in the simulator. So in the simulator, you have access to a sort of like a shortest optimal path uh, that navigates around obstacles that you just get that out of the box. It's not avail it wouldn't be available uh, in general in the real world, but because you're working in the Unreal Engine, it's one of the things you just get out of the box. So we used uh, the Unreal Engine to help us and uh, to help us generate demonstrations for this for this uh, uh, imitation learning setup, and then we so we trained a point goal navigation policy, and then we evaluated that point goal navigation policy in just a bunch of our apartments. Um, so one of the benefits of OpenBot is it's so lightweight; you can just build a few uh, for cheap, and then uh, you know. Everyone on the team can have one in their apartment and then you can be doing these like real world uh, evaluations. So then we evaluated these real world, uh, the, we evaluated this trained navigation policy in the real world uh, in our apartments. So I'll just show a quick uh, video. Um, and we actually did this experiment a while ago um, where we were still running on an older version of our code, an older version of un the Unreal Engine. So the visuals weren't quite as good. Um, but uh, that's what was available at the time. So we, we generated our, uh, our demonstrations and then here's us deploying uh, the train navigation policy in the real world. Okay. Uh, and we're able to sort of, you know, navigate through um, uh, kind of these cluttered arrangements of chairs and stuff like this. Okay, and uh, we found what I think is quite a startling conclusion and I would, I, and I would like to I would like to share the and I would like to share this with you. Um, we found that training in Spear enables zero shot sim to real transfer. Oh geez. Um, I'm not I'm not sure what's going on. I uh, that was not the startling conclusion that I was I was hoping to share with you. I wonder if um, uh, if this U if the if this HDMI connection w would still work on any computer. In other words, I wonder if it's the dongle or the. Um, ah, okay, that's working. Uh, it's uh, the stuff that I'm going to share is not in that PowerPoint, so it's okay. You know what? Um, it's okay. I'll just wing it, and I'll tell you guys about the ex uh, about the experiments because we got through all the eye candy already, and so now we can just we can just chat. Um, okay. So um, what we found uh, in in our sim to real experiment was that um, 
training only on synthetic data um, actually outperformed training on, uh, on real world data collected by, uh, so these, these slides will just be a distraction. The, the things that I'm talking about is, is like did not make it into this slide deck. Um, so actually, I'm just, is it okay if I just unplug? Because this will just be a distraction. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. So we we also collected um, uh, like so so we we collected synthetic data to train the, these point goal navigation policies, um, and we also uh, collected real world data where we distributed a bunch of open bots to a bunch of like human kind of novice pilots. We had them drive around their apartments, set up little point goal navigation. Oh, amazing. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Um, so. Amazing, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we also uh, collected real world data from real world human demonstrations um, and where you know it was just humans like human novice pilots driving around open bots um, in their in their apartments. Um, and we found somewhat remarkably that training on the synthetic data actually outperformed in a real world evaluation relative to relative to the, the, the real world data that we collected from humans. So how on earth is that possible when there's such a there's such a like pronounced domain gap, even in Spear, between sort of real world images and synthetic images? Well, it's because the visual domain gap is not the only domain gap that matters. There's also an optimality gap that where humans aren't that good at providing demonstrations. So it's just really hard in general to get humans to provide optimal, uh, optimal trajectories or optimal demonstrations. And that is an important form of a domain gap as well. So what we found in this experiment is actually the visual domain gap that you sort of take on by working with Spear is actually better than the trajectory optimality gap that you take on when working with humans. So we think that this approach of sort of using privileged information in a simulator, generating optimal trajectories using that, that privileged information and then using those as demonstrations, uh, we think that that's a promising general purpose approach uh, that could be used for like a, a wide variety of, of problems in robotics. Okay, and there's we did some other experiments. I don't have time for that. Uh, I, uh, um, we're trying to sort of, as our next steps, incorporate Mujoko. That's like the gold standard physics simulator uh, in the robotics community. This is like the earliest hint of us getting Mujoko working with one of the spear scenes. Um, we're, incorporate, we're busy at work incorporating more sensors, tasks, learning algorithms, uh, more a richer Python interface, doing co-simulation in Mujoko, et cetera. Um, uh, so Spear is a photo, so takeaways, Spear is a photorealistic simulator for embodied AI research. Uh, it's, you get state-of-the-art rendering today. In the next release, you'll get state-of-the-art physics as well. Our library of assets is high quality and it's growing. Um, and our software stack is completely 100% cross-platform and open source. And I really think now is the time for photorealistic simulation because, you know, we want to solve these uh, hard sequential decision-making problems in the real world, but learning in the real world is so slow and painful. So now is really the time for photorealistic simulation. Don't take my word for it though. Uh, we can just look at the cover of Nature from a couple of weeks ago where they did, uh, you know, where they, the world championship drone racing pilot now is an algorithm that was trained using reinforcement learning. And you guessed it, it was trained entirely in simulation. And so, uh, I think the revolution will not be supervised with real data, and that is my talk, 28 minutes and 45 seconds. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank, thank you for that fantastic save with the laptop and the HDMI <laughs> cable. That was much appreciated. Great save. Thank you, Mike. Can I ask you some questions? Okay. Am I asked the question? So you talked a lot about the realism, and I think it's one of the key point of view of Spear. Have you ever made some like um, benchmark of how much it does improve the performance of training robots, uh, like the, the actual, for example, the goal point? If you train on low resolution or ultra high resolution, do you see any difference? And it's the same question for the scene. Like, if we add more scene, does it help the robot train better? Anything like that? Yeah. Um, 
Ah, okay, fantastic question. So the question is, have we, have we like done any benchmarking where we show that this realism actually matters? Um, so uh, we have, but not for, uh, uh, not for active control problems. So we, because we, we thought that that was like not a good, like that was too complicated of a setup to really drill down into that specific question. So instead we focused on a passive perception task. And uh, the specific task that we focused on is semantic segmentation. So we, we trained uh, a semantic segmentation model with spear images and then images from several other simulators. So, uh, you know, just r uh, randomly chosen um, uh, camera poses, 10,000 images each, see which one improves semantic segmentation, real world semantic segmentation performance the most. We found that Spear outperformed all existing simulators, so we expect that that result would extend to sort of active control problems. We have not evaluated that yet. And another thing we haven't evaluated that you hinted at, which would be awesome, is uh, Unreal has a ton of little like knobs that you can tune to tune the amount of realism versus computational performance that you get. And I think that would be a fun, uh, experiment to try as well is to see like what what knobs give in on the unreal engine give you the biggest sort of bang for your buck where like this form of realism really matters a lot but then this other form of realism doesn't really matter that much because it's it's conceivable that maybe like noisy images uh, like certain kinds of noise wouldn't matter because sometimes as a form of uh, data augmentation you sometimes inject noise into your images so maybe some of the noise that you get from for certain rendering techniques uh, doesn't not does not have like a, de a deleterious effect on training but that I'm getting way over my skis here in terms of speculation but I think that's like uh, you've highlighted a couple of like r exciting experiments to try So uh, when you did the sim to real transfer experiment, uh, I was wondering how much of a difference uh, there exists between the real environment in terms of the, the layout or the content of the environment. How much of a difference there exists between the real environment versus the simulated? Is it a, like like total reconstruction of the real environment, or this is like just indoor scenes, but sort of random different indoor scenes? Um, yeah, great question. So uh, the real environments that we used for evaluation were just like team members' apartments. Um, and there are no team member apartments in the Spear data set of, of scenes. So they are not digital twins. It's just like sort of uh, reasonably, Spear consists of just reasonably functional kind of apartments, but none of those apartments mimic the layout of any of our actual real world apartments, so there's no digital twins in there. Um, and uh, yeah, and, but that nonetheless, that was enough to um, uh, enable uh, zero shot sim to real transfer. It's also worth mentioning that like, you know, before we take too much of a victory lap here, I mean, uh, the point goal navigation task that we were doing in the real world is not like the hardest navigation task you could possibly imagine. I mean, it, it's like a sort of, it's like kind of a, it's like a reasonable first thing to try. Um, but I bet if you um, sort of scaled up the complexity of the, um, of the, uh, of the problem, then you might need to, like I'm, I'm not claiming that all possible robotics problems will transfer with like a zero, in a zero shot way, you might need to sprinkle in some real world data depending on the difficulty of your problem, but at least for point goal navigation, in our case, we didn't need to, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm just wondering, since uh, the, uh, our CMOS or CCD sensors normally can see a different spectrum than our human eyes, like the infrared, and animals like cats and dogs, they can see different spectrums. So I'm wondering if it's an easy trick to add some infrared sensing into this scene. So because it's, I think it's useful for robots, because sometimes they want to see, oh, it's a heat, really heat, something like that. Um, yeah, great question. So the, the, the question is like, how easy or difficult would it be to incorporate like different modalities, like sort of infrared, like an infrared camera or something like that into Spear? Um, and uh, from a rendering perspective, uh, that's pretty straightforward. You could think of it as just like another, like a multi-spectral sort of 
uh, image where instead of RGB, it's like RGB and then some other frequencies as well. So, you know, instead of three channel, it's like six channel or something like that for the different sort of like wavelengths of infrared that you, that you care about. Um, so from a sort of rendering technology perspective, it's a pretty straightforward add-on. However, from a sort of like uh, uh, data perspective, it's not quite so straightforward because like, you know, all, any sort of graphics assets that you find, for example, like on the Unreal Marketplace or like, you know, that our artists have created manually, uh, they're set up to be RGB data. Like the, the textures and stuff are really RGB textures. And in order to do this like sort of faithfully, you'd really want to sort of from the ground up start with, you know, if you're doing like three extra channels of infrared, you'd really want to like have those three extra channels like in your textures. Uh, that are sort of attached to all the surfaces in your scene. Um, so an, we don't have that and like no graphics, like practically no graphics assets that you find in the wild will have that. Now, another question you could follow up with is like, well, could you plausibly hallucinate those extra channels? It, like, because it's the kind of the same problem as like, oh, if you had a, a red and green channel, could you do a reasonable job of hallucinating a blue channel, like for just real world textures? And you probably could. There's probably correlations between red and green and blue. And so I'm sure there's correlations between red, green, blue, and infrared that you could, that you could leverage as well. Um, but then you're sort of getting away from, that's sort of more of like a procedural content generation trick at that point because you're sort of doing like a learning trick to kind of hallucinate uh, content that artists didn't create. But nonetheless, I think that would be useful. That it would be cool to do that, but there, it's a technically nuanced topic and a great question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.